Hello and welcome to our February edition of Doing Business in Rwanda, where we focus on Rwanda's private sector, looking at its growth, its role within the economy, opportunities and outlook going forward. Welcome to the show. I'm Alicia Seckham. Well, the Rwanda government's aspiration of Vision 2020 is to develop an efficient private sector spearheaded by competitiveness and entrepreneurship. CNBC Africa's Lois Washira takes a closer look at the sector's growth and the role it plays within the economy. The private sector is a primary mover of the Rwandan economy. Efforts by government have been rewarded with Rwanda being ranked 52nd out of 185 countries on the World Bank's annual Ease of Doing Business Index, is the most improved in sub-Saharan Africa and the second most improved nation globally. It also leads the pack in the East African region, outranking both Kenya in 121st and Tanzania in 134th place. With an average GDP growth rate of 8.2% since 2000 and a projected GDP growth rate of 7.8% in 2013, Rwanda is the ninth fastest growing economy globally. In a 2012 World Bank report estimates private sector investment at 10.9% of GDP compared to 14.4% in the region in 2010. However, Rwanda has seen an improvement in this sector with an 82% increase in the number of registered businesses between 2007 and 2012. The Rwanda private sector is, uh, uh, I may say, still young, but very dynamic. Uh, very uh, uh, dynamic, it has uh, been developing itself, and, uh, but still uh, from the government assessment, we, we still feel that uh, there is a huge room for improvement, uh, particularly when it comes to take advantage of the opportunities we do have uh, in the economy. Uh, there are, for example, a number of areas where really uh, the government like to see uh, the private sector taking uh, the lead in terms of uh, mobilizing resources for investment. If I say, for example, energy. So uh, Rwanda now is suffering from uh, low generation capacity of uh, electricity or other source of energy. And uh, uh, we have been uh, going around to, to head hunting private investors to do something to help the country to increase the generation capacity. But uh, when you see how our own private sector is trying to organize itself to play a role, we don't see it coming, where at the same time they are the first one to complain on a daily basis about uh, uh, lack of uh, reliable energy and the cost. And in my view, it's not because they don't have the financial capacity. It's a question of uh, organization and how to take advantage of existing opportunity to tap into. The opportunities include investment incentives like exemption from import duties and sales taxes, as well as additional incentives for investors operating in free export economic zones. The government is also committed towards a comprehensive privatization policy that will help reduce costs and prices and widen consumer choice. The tea sector uh, is one of the you know, successful privatization ventures that government Rwanda has undertaken. Uh, until uh, 2002 or so, all tea farms used to belong to government, the farms and the factories. And um, of course, that what that would result into, you know, depleted machinery, uh, loss-making entities, uh, with the result that government had to be, you know, put in more money and put in more money until they were privatized. Now we have a very strong private uh, tea sector uh, in Rwanda. Uh, in fact, I think all of them, I think the last one, if it wasn't privatized recently, and there are about nine of them, it should be now maybe in the process of being privatized. That is one of the areas we're seeing so much growth in terms of volumes uh, of exports, but also in value because the, the, the methods of farming, the, the methods of processing, the impro impro improvements in efficiency has resulted into real gains for the country. Uh, in the mining sector, a uh, couple of uh, mines that were privatized and that has led into real investments that you can see that you know 
somebody is now not doing uh, top surface mining, but rather extraction, and that has you know led into employment creation, exports have increased, you know revenue generating uh, uh, lines for Rwanda in terms of foreign exchange, you could also see real gains. Uh, the hotel industry, what is now called Serena, it used to belong to government when it was a uh, hotel diplomat and became intercontinental. It's one of those that have, have been privatized. The, the ag agro-processing, a couple of uh, rice farms, a uh, couple of, um, I think also some coffee processing pl pl uh, factories that have been privatized. And since then, you can see real, real gains. Government wants a private sector-led economy. They do not wish to continue investing money into businesses. Like I said, they may be good at doing certain things, but they're not very good at doing business. So it is better in the hands of the private sector. Some economists are of the opinion that governments have no business running commercial institutions. As part of its long-term development goals embedded in its Vision 2020, the Rwandan government has actively embarked on privatization. The government has been focusing on privatizing a number of firms, particularly in the uh, banking sector. It has been successful in privatizing some of the banks over the last couple of years. Um, that has uh, improved competition amongst the banking sector that has increased productivity and has led to uh, reduction uh, in increase in deposit taking and reduction in uh, interest rates. Um, so it, we view it as very positive step on the part of the government. According to the Rwanda Development Board, a total of 86 public firms are expected to be fully privatized over the next five years, of which 56 are complete and seven have been liquidated. The partly privatized companies and those expected to undergo the process view the move as an opportunity to showcase the company's and country's growth potential through reliance on a vibrant private sector. The privatization process uh, is a very useful um, uh, growth phase uh, for a country uh, that, that that is emerging markets uh, like Rwanda. Um, the privatization helps uh, showcase the country and its, uh, and its uh, ability to mobilize uh, not only local but also international investors. Privatization always comes in with new ideas, new capital, new, new opportunities. Uh, it is always geared or intended to improve what is already good. Bank of Kigali, which is the only local bank listed on the Rwanda Stock Exchange, credits its growth to the privatization process. Uh, we got uh, privatized in 2011, uh, where 45% of the bank's uh, capital uh, was floated on the Rwanda Stock Exchange. And uh, the subscription was, uh, over, it was an oversubscribed uh, um, IPO by more than uh, 280%. Uh, with a significant participation from the international investors. Um, and this process, uh, as we were going through it, we were able to demonstrate to the international world uh, the benefits that one would derive from investing in Rwanda. We were able to showcase the strong uh, macroeconomic environment, uh, the GDP growth, the, the low inflation uh, rates over the last few years. And it was a good opportunity to get a feel uh, of what other investors think about the country. The international uh, allotment was oversubscribed by more than 300 times uh, and this in itself demonstrates that there is a huge appetite uh, for people out there uh, in the international markets to try and come and invest in Rwanda. Rwanda's national carrier Rwanda, whose privatization is taking shape, is quickly gearing up for expectation on actualization of the process. We are working hard on the viability side of it, the financials, have to look good. We have to start breaking even, we have to start making money, we have to start being profitable. Uh, beyond that, we have to build on our track record over the last few years to improve our customer centricity, our customer numbers, that of course uh, translate into revenue. Uh, keep our, our uh, safety record impeccable and to that we are working very hard probably before the end of this year to be IOSA certified which puts us at the next level in terms of safety and which sends a message straight to the market and to all our customers that we are a serious, safe and reliable airline. 
The emergence of a viable private sector that can take over as the principal growth engine of the economy is critical for Rwanda's development. This development will also ensure growth of a viable middle class of entrepreneurs. To reach a Vision 2020, um, there is a certain number of strategic priorities that, uh, that uh, the government has in place. One, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, stable macroeconomic uh, conditions. And uh, two is to increase um, uh, the, the um, improve the business, continue to improve business environment. And it's, uh, the government is working hard to achieve these objectives. There are a number of um, initiatives, for example, um, raising private sector pa participation in agriculture sector, uh, increasing access uh, to finance, as I mentioned earlier, facilitating trade, uh, uh, improving uh, service delivery uh, through uh, increased improving the um, education and training. There are a number of initiatives uh, that they have been focusing on and. Uh, and uh, together with the private sector uh, initiative, uh, increasing their investment, we, we see these as, as a positive step going forward and uh, um, bearing fruit over the in the medium term. Continuous improvement of the business environment is attracting international investors who applaud the country's ease of doing business. Companies now benefit from faster registration, better regulation and even provision of tax breaks. Fusion capital, when we began business in Rwanda, we were basically driven by one very fast economic growth that was taking place in the country. We heard about it, we went there, we did a bit survey, and we found the government. The growth was very, very fast. Second was the legal framework, which made it easy for us. One is that we could open a one-man company with, as one director without necessarily needing a local person. That made it easy for us again. The other one was when we went to visit the government offices, they promised us within 24 hours you have your certificate. That certificate is the PIN number, is the tax number, uh, it solved all our problems. It's also the city, that's actually what we can call the city council license for you to operate. So when we went there three years ago, within 24 hours, we had gotten all the legal requirements for us to start a business. On the back of this vision, in 2004, the Private Sector Federation, formerly a Chamber of Commerce, was established to act as a mediator between all business sectors and the government. At that point in time is, is when government started saying, even in their own planning, to say we need to find a way of, of supporting private sector. As a result of the formation of the Federation, uh, the smallest private sector that there was, they began engaging government uh, to find ways of you know, supporting them or passing such policies that would help uh, business thrive. Uh, so since then, you can see a shift of, of you know, talking private public investments to, to, to uh, private investments. That, of course, when that was put in place, they realized, oh, um, our businesses are too small. If there exist some uh, two infantry that they cannot survive. So they began putting in place uh, su some of the support services to businesses. Uh, and at that point is when they, 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 the private sector federation you know, started taking shape uh, with regard to you know, about six or four things that they, they, they did with regard to ensuring that the policies that are being passed, that, that the uh, regulatory framework or the, uh, the, the, the policies that government, the economic policies that government was passing are pro-business. So they began doing some advocacy. Uh, and of course that re translated into, we realize we can't do advocacy, we can't have businesses if we don't have support services for them. Uh, that's when capacity building for businesses became, became an issue and we started doing, so how, what do we do, how do we build capacity? And capacity is in many things. It's financial capacity, human intellect capacity, you know, even knowing exposure itself. Uh, then they realized, oh, there's no entrepreneurial culture in Rwanda, <laughs> so businesses aren't there. If they're there, they close easily. So all these things, the Foundation started looking at how do we then play a role in, in helping government to ensure that what they want to be put in place is realized. Taking advantage of this platform, the Private Sector Federation has been instrumental in steering regional and international trade for Rwanda's budding private sector farms. Since uh, a number of years back, uh, we realized that there was really a need 
to build to build a strong public private partnership in this country to maximize the potential uh, from the private sector to participate in the whole growth agenda and uh, the way you have been thinking doing it was uh, through establishing a, a public private dialogue platform it has been a dynamic process uh, at the beginning we thought perhaps it was necessary to establish a very uh, strong secretariat under the prime minister office but we realized sometime later that uh, perhaps this was not the most efficient way to do it because after a number of years we realized that the dialogue which has been uh, uh, conducted was was very small compared with what we were really, really expecting and uh, we in somehow uh, uh, decentralized a little bit but providing a way for really the private sector itself to take more ownership in preparing this public private dialogue process we decided to establish a very small unity within RDB working now with the private sector federation to design a public private dialogue framework uh, this is extremely important because it's through the public private dialogue that you can understand better what are the 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 challenge the private sector have and what are the expectation from the government in terms of facilitating them really not only to do business but also participating in investment projects if you look at the trade flows uh, rwanda was a net importer from the region uh, it's only now at the beginning to see uh, s targeting some of the companies to export into the region our, our fruit processing uh, company inyange uh, our handcrafts people uh, are now part of the juakari uh, uh, network in the region export some of the handcrafts um, uh, our services industry yeah, beginning to see some of our, our lawyers conduct business in the region in the region our uh, aud auditors so there's been a couple of, of things that we've worked on but y y you realize that uh, it would be difficult to, to to do that haphazardly but we'd rather have to engage the region uh, and our sister countries in the region to undertake certain reforms to allow free trade uh, and, and we working with uh, the East African uh, Community Secretariat to ensure that the reforms we need, for example, right of establishment for businesses, if, if one of uh, Rwanda has had to go and establish a business in Tanzania at the moment, uh, the requirement is that they have to get 51 shareholding from a Tanzanian. And that doesn't allow us to you know, uh, freely do business there. Uh, and, and until such reforms are undertaken in those countries, which Rwanda, by the way, has undertaken, and I think we have to go at, uh, on the top of, of, of the ladder. Uh, until those reforms are undertaken, it becomes difficult to have meaningful regional uh, investments or trade uh, happening between Rwanda and the other countries.